Welcome back to the Calculated Risk Podcast. I am Tyler Shoemaker, joined as always by Kelly Ford, and we are here for our Week 9 college football preview. This slate isn't quite as sexy as last week was, I don't think, at the top. Uh, we do have some really good matchups to get into, though. Uh, two, two, I think, really of interest, and then you know a third that, uh, you know, Ohio State at, at Wisconsin, I think, is probably the third kind of marquee game here this weekend where Buckeyes coming off the, the win against Penn State, potential letdown spot here. So we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. First, Kelly, let's kick it off with a neutral site game, Florida and Georgia uh, meeting as they do every year on a neutral field. I will let you do the honors and get us started with this one. Yeah, Tyler. I mean, I agree with your opening comments. Maybe not the best blockbuster matchup week, but we're really starting to run out of college football Saturday, so we got to enjoy them all. I know we will, and and we're going to get some great games. Maybe some off the radar ones are going to pop that we don't necessarily expect. You said it though. This is this is a really good one. It's the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, Tyler. This is one of only three regular season games that I support taking place at a neutral site, along with Army Navy and along with Texas Oklahoma in the Red River Shootout. Listen. I personally think that this game might have uh, or might be even better if we alternated between Athens and Gainesville, but these two fan bases are very adamant that they like this game being a neutral site. They like it in Jacksonville. They enjoy it. And I am a college football traditionalist. I love the traditions that we have in the sport. Every time we lose one, it makes me sad and we're losing more and more. So if this is one that we can hang on to and their fans love it, who am I to try to take that away? Give me the world's largest outdoor cocktail party in Jacksonville. I think it's great. Both these teams coming off a bye, which, again, I really like when the schedules are set up. That way you see it with Alabama, LSU. You see it in other big rivalry games around the country. It's awesome. No rest advantage for either side. Everyone's got two weeks to prepare. Let's get into it. Let's let's do it. This game has a watchability score of 7.8. But given the rivalry nature, I, again, personally like to give it a higher score. The main reason it's being downgraded here, if you will, 7.8 out of 10, is because of the projected competitiveness component. I have Georgia minus 14 and a half in this game. It's an 84% win expectancy for the dogs. At number 10, this is the lowest I've had Georgia power rated since 2016. That was Kirby's first year in Athens. The dogs have been downgraded 7.2 points since the preseason. That's the fifth most nationally, Tyler, in my model. But as I've said over and over on this show and other places throughout this year, Georgia doesn't have to be better than the 2021 and 2022 versions of itself. It only has to be better than the teams that are on its schedule in 2023. And that's exactly how my model continues to view the dogs, making them a favorite of at least a field goal in every remaining regular season game. I mentioned both these teams are coming out of their their off week. There's no rest advantage here, but Georgia should have the edge on both sides of the ball with the number seven offense and the number nine defense nationally. Based on my current numbers, this is the best opposing defense that Florida will face all season. The Gators are number 33 overall in the power ratings. They have the number 56 defense, and they now have a season-best number 23 offense. Graham Mertz, hey, people like to, you know, throw shade at him and say he hasn't had a great career, and hey, you are a highly touted guy, and it hasn't worked out. He's taking care of the football this year, and granted, they're not taking a ton of shots and trying to do anything crazy with him, but he's actually, I mean, he's playing pretty darn well and doing the things that he needs to do for Florida to be successful on that side of the ball. Georgia currently has an 80% chance to win the East Tyler, a 43% chance to make the CFP with a win in this game. Those chances improve to 85% and 49% respectively. A loss only drops Georgia's chances to 60% to make it to Atlanta, but the dogs would have just a 13% chance to make the CFP. That's how damning a loss could be for this Georgia team who does not have a whole lot of meat on the bone with this schedule, so they really can't afford a loss. I'm not suggesting that the, this, that the committee would keep out a 12 and one SEC champion, two time national champion Georgia. Like they wouldn't keep them out, but I'm suggesting maybe they should based on the resume that Georgia would have to offer at that point. A win for Florida and their chances to win the East improve from just 1% to 16%. So not a good chance either way, but a win does theoretically keep them in this race. Bottom line, I got Georgia minus 14 and a half. It's a 60% win expectancy, excuse me, a 16% win expectancy for Florida that they can stay in that SEC East race. Yeah, you mentioned Georgia's resume. I put out my resume rankings earlier this week. I've got Georgia number 10 currently in the resume rankings. And like you said, there's really not a ton of opportunity for them to make a lot of headway there. I mean, obviously you you get rewarded for just winning the games, but in terms of their, uh, you know, opponents 
average power rating, it's not not great compared to some of the other you know CFP contenders. So Georgia really needs, in my opinion, to run the table um, because with with one loss, I, I agree with you. I don't know that that's playoff worthy uh, a playoff worthy resume. In terms of this game, though, Georgia's my number thirteen power rated team. As we've as we've talked about, you know, I'm pretty low on them. They they came into the season as my number one team, down to number thirteen now. Florida number fifty nine. So that's the by far the lowest power rated team we're going to talk about here this evening. Um, in terms of projection, the line currently sitting Georgia minus fourteen and a half with a total of forty seven and a half. TSI projects. Georgia minus 16 and a half and a total of 50 and a half. So I'm actually, even though I feel like I'm low on Georgia, I must be even lower on Florida than the market. Um, and also we didn't mention Brock Bowers, obviously out um, reportedly four to six weeks. So he might miss the rest of the regular season here for Georgia. So I'm very curious to see what they look like without their, you know, potential Heisman candidate at tight end. Uh, in terms of how these teams match up on both sides of the ball, I've got the Georgia offense number 16 in the country and their defense number 12, which obviously that's still really good. It's just not it, – it's a far cry from where they've been the last couple of years where they had particularly 2021, which was, uh, I mean, just a historic level defense uh, defensive rating in my, in my TSI defensive ratings. Florida offensively, number 71 in the country. Not, not great. Uh, Graham Mertz has been – relatively efficient and i i believe he's number one in adjusted complete completion percentage on throws under 10 yards however they just don't have much downfield passing uh the run game's been kind of hit and miss uh so they're number 71 defense number 53 so florida's not really excellent on either side of the ball here georgia's got a huge advantage on, on both sides my numbers give georgia an 88 percent chance to win this game so just slightly higher than yours kelly uh, so I, I do think the dogs are, are going to get it done here. But like you mentioned, both teams are coming off a bye. So I'll be very curious to see which of these coaching staffs, you know, really took full advantage of the extra week of preparation and getting ready for the other one. So uh, excited to watch this nonetheless. I've, I've mentioned my brother's a big Florida fan. So I hope for his sake, you know, Florida makes this a competitive game. I know he would give anything for them to win this game. So uh, I'll definitely have my have my eye on this one for sure. Tyler, remind me, how'd that happen? How, how do we get an Ohio State fan <laughs> out, out of you and a Florida fan out of your brother? Because, you know, people might not remember, there was a time at a pretty, at a, I was pretty impressionable during this time. I couldn't stand Florida because in like a three month period, Florida beat Ohio State in the national championship of football and men's basketball. I was just like, no, like I'm done with Florida. You guys, uh, you're dead to me forever. I haven't forgotten it. How did that happen in your family? Yeah, he, uh, I think it was actually around that time. He was a big Tim Tebow fan because my brother is younger than me. He's four years younger than me. So he was a big Tim Tebow fan. He was he was in middle school kind of when when Tebow was doing his thing at Florida. And that was kind of his guy. So he he latched onto the Gators and, and has liked them ever since. So makes uh, sense. T Tebow's converted a lot, uh, a lot yeah. of fans uh, <laughs> for Florida. So, yeah, I, it makes sense. No, I get it. Yeah, so he, you know he's not an Ohio State hater or anything, so we we get along pretty pretty well on that. <laughs> but uh, moving on to our next marquee game, Utah hosting Oregon. Utah has just been unreal at home over the last handful of years. Kyle Whittingham obviously doing a great job with the Utes. This is a game uh, that Oregon currently is a six and a half point road favorite with a total sitting at forty eight and a half. I'll go first on this one. I've got Oregon as a 13 and a half point favorite here with a total of 45 and a half. So I would lean under strong lean to Oregon. I, I considered making Oregon uh, a best bet this week. I held off on that only because Utah has just been so good at home and have been able to, you know, take, take these games where they may not have the talent of the other team and just kind of ugly it up and, and make it closer than it should be. So I'm a little hesitant uh, to, to pull the trigger on Oregon. We'll see. I may, I may get there by, by week's end. But as it sits here here now, uh, I, I have not bet the Ducks yet, despite my number indicating I should probably do so. In terms of these teams' resumes, I've got Utah actually ranked higher in the resume ranking at number 17, Oregon number 18. In terms of the Pac-12 race, Oregon is my number one Pac-12 team, despite the loss to Washington. Um, numbers were, were pretty indicative that Oregon still was the better team coming out, out of that game, despite the loss. Utah, my number six Pac-12 team. So they've got some work to do. 
mainly on the offensive side. Now, I do think the last couple of games, the Utah offense has seemed to kind of get in a rhythm since their bye week. So I am kind of on alert for the offense to be turning a corner here. I also think the announcement that Cam Rising, the quarterback, will not play at all this season actually helps Utah in a way. He's obviously better than Barnes, the, the guy that started most of the year. But I think Barnes knowing that Rising is not – you know, potentially coming. He's not looking over his shoulder. I think that probably just gives him more confidence, lets him establish more of a rhythm as the guy to to keep that offense going in the right direction. But as it stands, the Utah offense ranked outside the top 100, number 101 in my rankings, in my offensive rankings, but their defense is number five. So that's what's keeping them, you know, so highly rated. They're number 30 overall in the country. This defense is is legit. They're They're very Iowa-esque. On defense, they they force a lot of turnovers. They they get some defensive scores, so that's keeping them in games. On the other side, we've got Oregon with the number six offense and the number ten defense. So top ten unit on both sides of the ball for me. Obviously led by their their offense, which has been extremely efficient with with both Nick's at quarterback. Bottom line, I've got Oregon minus thirteen and a half total of forty five and a half. That's an eighty three percent win expectancy for the Ducks. Man, Tyler. I- I think you, I think you have my notes on this game. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of similarities here. I mean, some of the numbers are a little off, but I, I agree with a, a lot of what you said. Uh, this is my number one game of the week with a watchability score of nine point three. I'm super excited for it. It, it should be really fun. It's a big time game in the Pac-12. I was really excited about this mini round robin in the Pac-12 among the preseason contenders of you know USC, Utah, Oregon, Washington. Hey, we're getting in the mix of it now. We're seeing how things are actually playing out, and, and it's a lot of fun. My most deserving rankings disagree with the AP poll on which team should be ranked higher in this game. It's probably not surprising. I have a lot of disagreements with the AP poll and the most deserving um, as we go throughout the year. I got Utah number 10, Oregon number 16 in those resume rankings. But I do agree with Vegas on who should be favored. And earlier today, I think the line was Oregon minus seven. You're saying at time of recording, it's actually Oregon minus six. I was right on with Vegas because my model has Oregon minus seven. Um, It's a 69% win expectancy for the Ducks in this one. Despite the win against Oregon State last week, Tyler, Oregon fell from number five to number nine in my power ratings. That regression was due to the defense. They fell from number 21 to number 27. The offense, though, they actually improved, at least with regard to their their unit ranking. They are now a season-best number two nationally behind my new number one. Tyler, I have a new number one on the offensive side of the ball. Let me see if you can guess it. Someone that I haven't had before. Have a, I've had Ohio State in that spot. I've had USC in that spot. I've had Washington in that spot. I have a new number one. Any guess? It's got to be LSU. It's LSU. There you go. You got it. LSU is my new number one offense right now. Oregon sitting in that number two spot. The timing could not be better for the Bo Nix led offense to be peaking because based on my current numbers at number 10 nationally, the Utah defense is the best opposing defense that the Ducks will play all season. For as good as this Utah defense has been, though, Tyler, this offense has struggled this year. Listen, it's understandable given the no cam rising. Like I came into the year projecting this this Utah offense to be top 15. No cam, if you would have told me no cam rising, I would have said, okay, top 30, maybe top 35, but like certainly not worse than that. This unit now ranks number nine in the Pac 12. They're number 52 in the nation. They just haven't figured it out on that side of the ball without rising this season. Now they still only have one loss, but they just haven't figured it out from an efficiency standpoint on the offensive side. The defense, as you said, really carrying this team right now to a really impressive record. The Utes are number 21 overall in my power ratings. Rice Eccles. It's one of the best home fields in the country. Tyler, shout out to to, to our guy, Brett Gibbons, because Brett turned me on to this stat. Utah has not lost at home if you take out the COVID year. Again, the 2020 COVID year, that's just a weird year. You, you, there was no home field advantage that year. There was no one in the stands. So you take that year out of it. Just a weird all, all around year. Utah has not lost at home since 2018, Tyler. It's been five years since any team has gone into Rice Eccles and got a win if you take out the COVID year. And again, I know that's a quali- qualifier, but... Listen, the COVID year was that was just weird. And you can't really even talk about home field that year because there was no one there. So anyway, it's one of the best home fields in the country. They haven't lost there in forever. Still, though, my numbers give Oregon the edge on both sides of the ball. The winner of this game will have the second best chance to make it to Las Vegas. If Oregon loses, they're still squarely in the mix. But a loss all but eliminates the Utes based on my current numbers for a spot in Las Vegas um, coming out of this one. 
Oregon also needs this game to stay alive in the CFP hunt. A win would give the Ducks a 22% chance to make it to the Final Four based on my current numbers. Bottom line, I've got Oregon minus seven. It's a 31% chance that Utah moves to four and one in conference play. Tyler, if you would have told Utah fans, hey, Cam Rising isn't going to play. He's not going to play all year, actually, but he's not going to play to this point. Coming out of the Utah game, you guys are going to have one loss, and you're going to be four and one in conference. They would have taken that in a heartbeat. That is what Utah has on the table in front of them if they're able to get it done this week against the Ducks. It's just, it's pretty amazing. Uh, Whittingham, I mean, great coach, been there for a long time, great home field, just something, this program, it's just, it's just special. They just got something going right now, and uh, we'll see. It's going to be a big test for them against Oregon at home this week. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt about it. Um, Utah, it's weird. Like, I find myself, like, just having this instinctive, like, negative feeling about Utah as a team this year, but then you look and they've lost one game. Like I feel like I feel like I've mentally eliminated them from playoff contention, but they're right. they're absolutely they're absolutely not. Uh they, you know, a win here and they're they're in pretty good shape actually. So uh you know that's that's why I like having the numbers to to kind of give me that that perspective that maybe my my eyeballs uh you know lie to me. Moving on to our third marquee game and again Marquee in, in quotes here. Um, this this game kind of has has lost some some luster as well after you know Wisconsin had their the early season loss to Washington State last week. They were down. They had to score I think eighteen unanswered points in the fourth quarter to beat Illinois. This is not quite the fully functional Wisconsin team that we think is going to be coming under Luke Fickle. Um, they're trying to change their offensive identity, going to more of an air raid, but their personnel still kind of fits the old school Paul Christ way. So. Wisconsin kind of in a transition year here, still a good team. Uh, Kelly, I will let you do the honors here with the Buckeyes and the Badgers. Right on. Yeah. Ohio state, man, this is a good resume. I've got them number one in my most deserving rankings. They're number one in record achievement, only a 6% chance. The average top 25 team would be seven and zero against Ohio state schedule outscoring their opponents by 13.2 points per game, more than would be expected of the average top 25 team. That's number four nationally for Ohio State. They're number two now in my power ratings. They have been jumped by Michigan, as we talked about on the show earlier this week, Tyler. Ohio State was in that number one spot for five straight weeks. Now number two. Um, the defense, though, this is the season best, tied for season best, number four nationally. The offense has now slipped to a season worst, number 15. It's the first time all year I've had the Ohio State offense outside the top 10 nationally. Again, this team started the, this unit started the season number one on the offensive side of the ball, quickly gave that up to USC and has been hovering between five and 10 since then. They're now number 15. So I'm not suggesting that's necessarily um, too much pause for concern in this game because I still do give the Bucks the advantage on both sides of the ball. Uh, Wisconsin has the number 17 defense, so that's still you know a really good defense, number two defense in the Big Ten West behind only Iowa, and a very competitive rank compared to the their opposing Ohio State offense here. But the, the, the big difference here is, is the Wisconsin offense. I have met a season low, number 62, and again, Ohio State's defense is at a season high, number four. I know Ohio State's got to go on the road. I know I talk all the time about that's the hardest thing to do in college football. I know Camp Randall's not an easy place to play. This is a night game. Uh, it's in prime time. It's my number two game of the prime time window at a 7.9 watchability. So there's that working against the Buckeyes, but I don't know. I think Ohio State's just the more talented team. They have to avoid a letdown after what was a really emotional and hard-fought win last week against Penn State. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I just I don't see the path for Wisconsin because I just don't think their offense is going to be able to, to, to do enough against Ohio State. Like, even if Ohio State's offense sputters and they don't put up a lot of points, I could see the Ohio State defense maybe even scoring points. I mean, certainly putting the offensive position to have short fields and and, and get turnovers. They, they might score some points in this game, I think, based on the large discrepancy I have. So I got Ohio State uh, 87% win expectancy. Minus 16 is what I make this one. I think the Buckeyes get it done and continue their perfect season and ultimately continue that march to the showdown in the game at the big house in the final week of the regular season. Yeah, and one thing that I forgot to mention too, also Wisconsin starting quarterback Tanner Mordecai broke his hand and he is out. Uh, I, I believe he missed the last game as well, but he he's going to be out for a while. So uh, Ohio State will be facing the Wisconsin backup quarterback in this game as well. Uh, in terms of how I, my number see these teams stacking up, in terms of the resume, Ohio State's my number two 
team in the in my resume rankings, Wisconsin number 30. In terms of power ratings, Ohio State's my number three power rated team, Wisconsin number 28. So from power rating perspective, they're still respectable. Again, I don't adjust that for injury. You know, Tanner Mordecai is maybe worth three, three and a half points to the to the power rating, I, I would estimate. Uh, right now, this line sitting Ohio State minus 14 and a half with a total of 43 and a half. I project Ohio State minus 16 with a total of 44 and a half. So pretty close to the market here on, on both of these numbers. Not not a huge lean for me either way. That's an 87% win expectancy for Ohio State in this game. Like you said, I, as long as they come in mentally ready to play, I, I don't think the Buckeyes should have any issues here. Their defense is still number one uh, in the country for me. Offense, exact same as you, Kelly, number 15 in the country. Wisconsin's offense, number 54. And again, that's not accounting for the quarterback, so it's probably worse than that. Defense, number 25. So respectable on the defensive side as we've we've – come accustomed to with Wisconsin, but still not enough that should really threaten Ohio State in any way on either side of the ball. I would I would anticipate a, a fairly comfortable uh, Ohio State win here as long as they come in mentally ready to play. Uh, Kelly, any other any other thoughts on on that or any of these these games that we've touched on here before we hit our rapid fire? No, I think they're going to be great games. I'm looking forward to them. Uh, another big game that I know we're going to do in the rapid fire that we didn't touch on in the deep dive, Duke at Louisville. Don't sleep on it. I know we're going to pick it, but that's just another game in the afternoon window. Uh, and and this is not the week to go to bed early. Not that any week is a week to go to bed early, but you've got Oregon State at at Arizona in, in, the, in the late night window there. 10.30 kickoff on ESPN, it looks like. That's my number three game of the week by watchability. So, um I mean, never go to bed before the games are done. That's common knowledge at this point if you if you follow me. But this week in particular, because I think that's a pretty good game in the Pac-12 that uh, people need to pay attention to. Yeah, I'm going to need to uh, stock up on some monsters uh, this, this weekend to be able to stay up and watch that. <laughs> All right, let's 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 hit our rapid fires here, uh, give you guys our projections on, on some of these other you know, meaningful, meaningful games. We want to try to include as, as many teams here as we can and just hit them quickly. Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, line currently minus Oklahoma minus 10 with a total of 65. I project Oklahoma minus 22. This was the best bet for me on my VEASAN article this week. I've already bet Oklahoma minus the 10, uh, and I would have a slight lean to the under here as well. I'm Oklahoma minus 15 and a half, so definitely with you on the Vegas line. Not not quite as aggressive as, as your model is in terms of the, the Oklahoma advantage here, but it's an 86% win expectancy for the Sooners. Yeah, just a, a quick handicapping note on that. I, I think we're getting Oklahoma at a pretty cheap price. Obviously, my numbers have been super high on Oklahoma all year. They played a subpar game against UCF, squeaked by one by two last week. So I think we're getting a, a cheaper price here on Oklahoma than we than we normally would. So I'm, I'm going to lay the points with the Sooners. Next game, Louisville and Duke. You mentioned this, Kelly. This is another weird one. Right now, Louisville, Louisville is a four-point favorite. I project Duke as a seven-and-a-half-point favorite. But again, this line is telling us – no Riley Leonard, who I would, uh, after seeing what their backups done, I would I would actually probably say Riley Leonard is worth about seven and a half points to the spread. Uh, I think he's that valuable. Uh, one of the few one of the few players in all the country that I would make that valuable to the spread. Um, total currently sitting at forty six and a half. I make it fifty uh, again. That's assuming Riley Leonard plays. They're just Duke is a completely different team with him out of the lineup. So take that for what it's worth. Yep, not accounting for the Riley Leonard uh, injury or potential uh, missing of the game. My numbers have Duke minus one uh, in this one, 54% win expectancy for the Blue Devils. This is a huge leverage game in the ACC. The winner of this game is going to have the second best chance to make it to the ACC title game. Uh, the loser, they're not out of it, but they're definitely fighting an uphill battle from there. Outs I mean, Duke, North Carolina in a couple weeks, that's another big leverage game. But outside of that, I mean, this is this is it. This is the ACC title game race, what it's coming down to. You can always get an upset, like we saw last week with North Carolina and Virginia, but barring any big upsets, um, doesn't get bet any bigger than this in, in it for an October game in terms of what it means to the conference championship race. So Duke minus one, 54% win expectancy for the Blue Devils. Yep. Next game, Notre Dame hosting Pitt. Uh, Notre Dame currently a 20-point favorite with a total of 44.5. I project Notre Dame minus 26.5. With a total of 52 and a half. So I'd have a, a pretty strong lean towards Notre Dame and towards the over in this game. 
Yeah, I got Notre Dame minus 20 and a half. It's a 92% win expectancy. Notre Dame's coming out of an off week. Pitt's coming off a loss on the road at Wake Forest. Like, I... Uh, I don't see the path here where Notre Dame does anything other than win this game pretty comfortably. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Uh, Mountain West, pretty big game in the Mountain West. Boise State hosting Wyoming. Boise State a five-point favorite with a total of 49 and a half. This is another game that uh, was in my best bets article this week. I took the five points with Wyoming. I make Wyoming a half-point favorite in this game. I uh, make the total 51 and a half. So no, no play for me there. Slight lean to the over. I've got Boise State minus three and a half in this game. It's a 61% win expectancy. And yes, big leverage game between this one and uh, Fresno State and UNLV. Man, there's two really big games in the Mountain West Conference race as Air Force is just like hanging out. Hey, yeah, we're undefeated. On Someone come out here and play us in the championship game. Why don't you? So that's how it's shaping up in the Mountain West. But yeah, I like Boise State three and a half, 61% win expectancy for the Broncos. A Broncos team that's not having a good year. I mean, let's be honest. They're not having a good year. They're coming out of an off week. They needed it, hopefully, to reset for that team, and, and we'll see how it goes. Big game next week at Fresno State for, for Boise State. Yeah, that's uh, that was part of my handicap as well. They're they're kind of in a look-ahead spot. I also just think these teams are kind of going in different directions. Like, I, I think Wyoming's a, a team kind of on the rise. Boise State kind of has, has had a letdown year. Uh, nonetheless, moving on, Cal and USC. USC coming off a tough loss third consecutive loss in the Lincoln Riley era to the Utes uh, line. Currently USC minus 10 and a half with a total of 67 and a half. I make this USC minus seven and a half with a total of 66. So no strong play either way. I would lean Cal here. I, I don't like what I'm seeing uh, from, from the USC program, from the, the body language, the, you know, players weren't avail- made available to talk to the media. Lincoln Riley missed two practices this week with, you know, quote unquote sickness. And, you know, look, it happens. People get sick. If it were me and my team just lost that game and I didn't make my players available after the game, I would have done everything I could to be a practice. But that's just me. Um, Pure speculation. If I was going to make a play here, I I would play Cal for sure. My numbers have USC minus 11 and a half. It's a 79% win expectancy for the Trojans. But I don't disagree with some of the comments that you made about USC. Cal's coming off of an off week here. So they've got the rest advantage. Uh, USC back-to-back losses, as you mentioned. This defense is at a season low number 67. So again, it just keeps getting worse on that side of the ball. For as good as the offense is, we talked about it over and over. The defense is going to cost them. And they have dearly so far. They might not be done because USC, I'm not saying they're looking ahead because I don't know what USC is really. They only have one conference loss, so they're still in it. But realistically, I don't think they really believe they're in it. They've got Washington and Oregon and then close with UCLA after this game. So, I mean, if USC somehow drops this game, six and six becomes a potential outcome for the Trojans. They'll be an underdog against Washington. They'll be an underdog against Oregon. They'll probably be favored against UCLA, at least right now. But, like, can you imagine? This, can you fathom six and six USC coming into the year with all the hype they had? And I mean, shoot, I was saying they had like a 20, 25% chance to make the playoff. They need USC needs this game to avoid an embarrassing season potentially. So we'll see. But yeah, my numbers have uh, USC minus 11 and a half. Yeah, I, I just checked. I've got them projected for seven and a half wins at, at this point with my updated numbers. So um, not, not looking good. Uh, rumors already swirling about, you know, potential Lincoln Riley departures and, and that sort of. Cliff Kingsbury becoming an actual assistant. It's it's uh, kind of kind of a mess in, in Southern Cal right now. I, I would not want to be in that program. All right, that's going to do it for our rapid fire. Kelly, one last note. I do feel obligated to take a small victory lap on something we talked about in the preseason, and that's Conference USA, Liberty, Western Kentucky. They played head-to-head. Uh, we're, we're recording this third, um, Wednesday night. They played last night. Liberty took it to them. Uh, my numbers co- coming into the season, my preseason numbers were extremely high on Liberty, been really high on them all year. So I was glad to see, to get some vindication there that they they kind of took it to uh, Western Kentucky last night. Yeah, if I go back and look, I mean, I, I had Liberty, I had Liberty as the second best team in the Conference USA and the second best chance to make it. But certainly I had Western um, as the favorite and I had Western as a favorite. It looks like until after week three that it flipped and it's stayed Liberty since then. But yeah, absolutely. You were on it from the beginning and Liberty now um, 
has secured their spot in the Conference USA championship game, and they will await um, to see who it's going to be. It won't be Jacksonville State, who might be the second best team in, in the conference because they're ineligible with the transition from FCS. So maybe they get Western again in that one. But yeah, kudos to you. That was a great call. And uh, we'll see if they can finish it out. Right now, my numbers uh, give it a... Let me look real quick. Liberty, if I go to their team dashboard, my numbers give it a... 33% chance to finish the regular season 12 and 0. That's before the Western result. So that's going to, I mean, that's going to skyrocket now at this point. I yeah. haven't run the updated numbers. Th these midweek games are great. I love them because it gives us something to watch, but I don't like what it does to me trying to talk about these teams in the time yeah. between they play and the time I update the numbers the next Sunday because now I'm yeah. talking out of date. So <laughs> um, anyway, kudos to you. Great call and uh, look forward to seeing if they can finish the job. What do you think? They're going to finish 12 and 0? Yeah, I I would be very surprised if they if they don't. Um, I mean, my my numbers have them very very strong uh, favorites to to go twelve and zero. So uh, we'll we'll see. But you know, I'm I'm wrong quite a bit. So gotta gotta celebrate the victories when when we get them. But that's gonna do it for this episode. That was that was a great one. Looking looking forward to week nine. We will be back on Monday as always with our recap, updated power ratings, updated resume rankings all of that good stuff. Make sure you follow Kelly on X at K Ford ratings. Follow me at T shoe index for Kelly Ford. I'm Tyler shoemaker. And that was calculated risk.